jump right away to our next speaker, Peter Gilbert, a producer, director, and part-time lecturer at Wake Forest University. He's completed work in documentaries, feature films, commercials, and music videos. He served as a producer and director of photography for the 1994 award-winning film, Hoop Dreams. He'll be signing autographs after for $100 for each one. I'll take 20. Please, Peter, without further ado, thank you. I think as a filmmaker, I wouldn't know how to use a mic, but. Uh, hello, everybody. It is really great to be back at Wake Forest. I've been gone for a couple of months, so it's great to be here and great to be with Ted. Um, I come here today, I speak to you as a filmmaker. Uh, and where's the clicker? Oh, there we go. Um, and I do all kinds of films, but my passion, is social issue documentary films. What I want to do with you today is discuss storytelling in, in the current, what I consider the renaissance of this art form, and then change direction a bit to discuss how some stories come into being. On a technological level, my field is truly evolving day by day. There are more platforms and places to show my work, to show my stories than ever been before. The way that we watch documentaries changes every day. We see them in theaters, on smartphones. We stream them to our computers. We can buy them as digital files. We can be old fashioned and still buy a DVD. Or we can be like most computer savvy people who are sitting out there. You just rip them for free. <laughs> um, I keep telling my kids not to do that because that's how I try to pay for them to go to college. Um, but what really makes it a renaissance for me is how democratized filmmaking has become. There is no reason for any of you in this audience not to make a film right now. Digital media and computer software has opened up the door for everyone to become a filmmaker in a cost-effective and immediate way. I can shoot and edit a film and have it up in YouTube in a couple of hours. How amazing is that? It's so incredible, this ever incredible, ever fluid technology really excites me. Now, for many members of my community, it scares them to death. But I must say, I embrace it all wholeheartedly. I embrace the massive quantity of information available and the interconnectedness we all can share. As a documentarian, this digital connection is extremely exciting. But it is a small piece of our puzzle. So let me explain what, could, what a documentarian, and in my mind, all filmmakers are in their purest form. We are all people who just love stories. We are all people who need to tell stories. I'm the person who loves to hear the story. I'll sit around with you all day and listen to them. Stories are my comfort food. I was the kid at the family gathering who was begging my relatives to tell the same story over and over again. How'd you meet mom? How did dad? I loved it. To hear those stories connected me to my past and present in much the same way we are all now interconnected by Facebook, texting, and all the other digital media. I don't think it's a coincidence that Facebook's new look is that of a timeline, so that a user can scroll through their own life as they have devised and created on Facebook and look at their friend and family's lives in a linear, narrative, filmic way. Communicating in all forms of digital media is new, but in many ways, it gives us the same comfort and experience I derive from sitting on my parents' laps and hearing them talk of the day's activities. But as I began my career as a documentarian, I fell in love with telling a story by using a style of filmmaking that was called cinema verite, or as I like to call it, longitudinal filmmaking, because it takes so damn long for the films to get done. Um, many of my films are of this form, which is to follow someone's story for years at a time, to film them as much as I can, to be immersed in their stories, to let a story develop in front of me, and then to shape it into a piece of compelling drama and hopefully into a thought-provoking social issue film. I hope the audience 
the audience is seeing an issue through the actions, conversations, the good times, the bad times, the repetition that shows up in the everyday complexity of life, that I can get to a form of the truth for them. That rather than hearing about poverty, genocide, race, the progress of the American dream from pundits in the news, I want you to see the world through my subject's eyes. That style works for certain stories, but not for all of them. My longitudinal films are immediate. They are a way of telling a story or a history as it unfolds in front of us. Every tale has its own needs. So as I get older, I become more attuned to all the stories that are around us that must be preserved in some form. That all of us have that power, be it using it a digital phone, a camcorder, or conducting interviews and recording them via Skype. The sky is the limit for making sure that we preserve our family's histories. We should record our parents, our mentors, our friends, but still we all have an idea or know stories or history that must be preserved so that the current generation, as well as the ones in the future, can learn from them. And because of my age and the ever-present march of time, I can get deeply depressed over stories that I should have told and have not or in many cases, the ones that got lost by the path my life has taken. As documentarians, we all have stories that we felt like we let get away. So now I have a wrinkle I'd like to float by you as well. It's about serendipity, about history needing time to play out, for stories to have time to play out, about how when it does, perspectives, context, and importance can shift and sometimes come into a radically sharper focus. That's been my experience, and let me now share with you an exciting example of what I mean. So as you see up here, I've had this up for quite a while, but the city of Chicago. Um, first, you need to know a little bit about my upbringing. I grew up in Chicago, a Jewish kid and a child of the 60s. My parents were hardcore liberal activists, Dinner conversations at my house growing up covered all the bases, civil rights, the Vietnam War, corporate injustice, racial injustice. I'm a child of post-World War II generation that was defined by the Holocaust. My parents lost family, as did all of their friends. Many in my community were new to the United States, coming from Europe right after or right before the war. Many were survivors who believed that after seeing genocide in person, that they would make sure that it would never happen again. And that conversation has never stopped. In eighth grade, through high school, I was trucked off to a private school, one I had to commute 45 minutes to get to. Oh, I did that well. Um, the journey literally and figuratively took me in, um, to a new eye-opening world, a world I had never truly been a part of, even though my parents were extremely open-minded and had friends from everywhere, we were still in a rather segregated America. It was only five years before that President Johnson had signed the Civil Rights Act into law. It was here at my new school in Hyde Park. I met my best friend, Steve Brown. Steve was African-American, and I was the white kid embraced by Steve's family. I was given a key to the house, it was with Steve in his house that I truly learned about one side of the black American experience. It was a gift that has informed me forever and has informed my films. At his house, I first encountered a story of a life, of one man's life. Steve and I wanted to tell this story. Steve and I have tried making films together for years. Um, and I'll tell you, by the way, about the story in a minute, because in my mind, it's an amazing and important piece of history. But I want to be honest that it wasn't that we didn't know how to tell a story or couldn't figure out how to tell a story at the time, but rather we just couldn't get our collective act together to do it. We were starting careers, me in film, Steve in advertising, time slipped away, and the central character of our story, who you will soon meet, died unfilmed. We messed up so badly that we hadn't shot a single frame of film or attempted to record the magnificent voice of this great, utterly unique man. Hopefully, okay. As the years went on, we realized that sadly, we had totally missed the boat, or at least we thought so. 
Now, before anyone races ahead and assumes that this is another narrative about a shoebox filled with snapshots of someone's remarkable but anonymous grandfather or great uncle, it's not. This gentleman's life is actually surprisingly well documented. But it's taken us moving into the digital age, time passing, major history being made, and pieces serendipitously falling into place that the story we wanted to tell has finally um, become clear. So I want to show you a few photos of a man um, who you probably won't know his name. Oh, now you do. Um, so anyways, this is a face you won't recognize and whose list of accomplishments are most stunning and impressive, precisely because the world doesn't know anything about them. This is Earl B. Dickerson, the subject of our film. Here is some of Earl's backstory. Earl was born June 22, 1891, Canton, Mississippi, the son of a slave who brought her freedom. His father passed away when he was four. His mom took in wash to support her son. He experienced the KKK firsthand in Canton, and his mother saved up money and sends him to a private missionary school in New Orleans. Here, a Caucasian teacher at the school realizes how brilliant Dickerson is and pays for him to go to the mecca of learning at that time, the laboratory school at the University of Chicago, which happens to be located in Hyde Park in the map I showed you earlier. He is smuggled aboard a Chicago-bound train by the porters and with a couple of bucks in his pocket arrives in Chicago in 1907 at age 15 to attend the lab school. Coincidentally, it was 60 plus years later that Steve and I met at that very same high school. Sorry, that's out of whack. Okay. Uh, he became, this is when he was at the University of Illinois. He is a man of many firsts. He founded the, this is the, a picture of him at the Kappa uh, fraternity, which he founded, one of the first uh, chapters of an all-black um, African-American fraternity. Um, after graduating, uh, in 1914, he goes and teaches back down south at Tuskegee University under Booker T. Washington. This is him with his um, fraternity brothers with Calvin Coolidge. Um, he sort of ends up showing up everywhere. Going back. He went to the war, World War I. He became one of the first black officers, second lieutenant, and served as a French interpreter. Serving his country sparked his determination to achieve success and equality. He became one of the founders of the American Legion. Dickerson personally organized the Chicago Post. I'm sorry, I'm having to jump ahead. He enrolled at the University of Chicago Law School. He was the first black gra to graduate the school in 1920. His specialty was constitutional law. His first job was general counsel for a black insurance company, a company that provided insurance to blacks who were shunned by the large white companies. He was Chicago's first black Democratic alderman. In 1940, he, har he argues Hansberry v. Lee before the U.S. Supreme Court, gaining an important ruling that begins the legal march to defeat racist real estate covenants in the United States. Again, in another remarkable twist, the Hainsbury of this case was the father of playwright Lorraine Hainsbury, who would go on to write A Raisin in the Sun, one of America theater's great works, with its alternate take on America's dream and a black family struggle to move into a white neighborhood on the south side of Chicago. Dickerson is one of the original six members of FDR's first Fair Employment Practices Committee tasked with investigating the exclusion of blacks from war-related jobs after World War II. In 1949, he is the first black to move into and integrate Chicago's Hyde Park neighborhood, home of the University of Chicago and the lab school where he had gone to school 40 years earlier. These are a few shots from his daughter's debutante party. That is a 
the tent seen from the uh, top of his three flat that he owned in that neighborhood. And this is Eleanor Roosevelt, who was one of his friends who was visiting him at his house. He then became the first black president of the National Lawyers Guild. Um, he was a member of the NAACP's Legal Defense Fund, the instrumental legal organization in the Brown v. Board case. He was elected to the board in 1941. And he was CEO of the first black company to be listed on the National Stock Exchange. In this picture, he's talking at the Waldorf Astoria. Ironically, or perhaps most appropriately, he was the first black person allowed to stay in that hotel. Um, he was then associated with Supreme Life for 64 years as general counsel. During the Depression, though, he showed extremely shrewd legal maneuvering, and he brought Supreme Life into being one of the three most powerful black companies in America. Here he's showing Reverend King around the insurance company's headquarters office. In 1966, it was Dickerson who gathered several black businessmen together in his home and persuaded 50 of them to pledge 100 bucks a month to support King's efforts during his 23-month stay in Chicago to fight for improved housing and education for blacks. Incredible moments and events and people crisscross Dickerson's zealot life story which, as one person said, is sort of like going through a stroll of who's who in America. Consider this. He escapes the South only to go back to teach for a year at Booker T. Washington's Tuskegee Institute. Later, he becomes best friends with W.E. Du Bois, who is from the other end of the political black spectrum. Du Bois was the head of the Progressive Party. Dickerson is effectively a capitalist running one of the America's most successful black-owned businesses whose progressive party politics, uh, I'll get there, there he is, Robeson, um, whose progressive party politics have him stand by his friend Paul Robeson, a communist during the height of the McCarthy era witch hunt. He was Robeson's lawyer. He hires a young aide seen in this picture, named John Johnson, the founder and publisher of Ebony and Jet magazine, the nation's foremost chronicler of the black experience, a publication instrumental in the civil rights movement. And sort of on and on it goes. Kennedy, Robeson, and there he is. He met with every president from the time, from Calvin Coolidge all the way up to modern day. So a remarkable life, a supreme life. How is it that we don't know this story? Business, politics, law, Earl Dickerson was a lion in all three areas, touching all in ways that fundamentally shaped African American, and I'd argue American life in the 20th century. As a filmmaker, I'm drawn to this story like a moth to a flame. Inspiring, historical, improbable, deeply personal and unique, the story of Earl Dickerson, my friend Steve's grandfather, is one that needs telling. We know it's now time to tell Earl's story. We still have witnesses and voices who can make this story come to life. We also have the life experience and distance from our own personal histories to understand this incredible man. But more importantly, we have the past and present to reflect on the frame of our story. In 1952, W.E. Du Bois wrote to Earl Dickerson about running for office, the highest office in the land. Du Bois wrote Dickerson an amazing letter. To paraphrase because of time, he told Dickerson that he would suffer great injustice, but now was the time for him to run for president the time for a man of color and death to run for the land's highest office. In 1949, Dickerson buys a house on South Drexel in Hyde Park neighborhood. And let me close with this thought. Dickerson was a man so far ahead of his time, as another Chicago newspaper would write, that even Negro chroniclers viewed him more as an anomaly than a, per, uh, a precursor of things to come. That was written in 1984. 
when Dickerson was 92 years old. Well, time marches on and things come. People have arrived. We now have an African-American president, something many of us, including Steve and I, never thought or dreamed that we'd see in our lifetime. But if we had thought about it, the person we might have imagined would have been a lot like Earl Dickerson, smart, driven, articulate, an attorney versed in constitutional law, who taught at the University of Chicago, where Earl graduated, an amalgam of the American experience. Who would have guessed that President Obama, our first African-American president, would live 600 feet from Earl Dickerson's home as he does now? We can't wait to talk to President Obama on camera and ask him if he knew about Earl Dickerson, whose family lived down the street from us. Our hope is that he will, but if he doesn't know about Earl Dickerson, we can't wait to tell him how he influenced his life, and that's what our film will be about. So to end, sorry, to end, just go out there and make stories. They're everywhere. The ones that you thought you've lost, you have the time, you have the technology, and you can make anything you want now. It is a beautiful time. Thank you. Sorry. Just in the uh, essence of time, ladies and gentlemen, very quickly, 30 seconds. Thank you so much, Peter.